Okay, um, it's 632. Let's go ahead and um, open the uh, open session part of this meeting. Um, let's see. Um, I will give a report um, of actions taken in closed session. The board voted unanimously to authorize the district manager to sign a water rights protest resolution agreement subject to certain changes requested by the board. Um, we're now reconvening the open uh, session. Holly, can you take the roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Henry. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay, um, now is time for oral communications from members of the public on items uh, within the purview of the district, but that are not on the agenda tonight. Are there any oral <coughs> communications? Seeing none, hearing none. Was somebody trying to make a comment? Okay. Um, We'll go ahead. There is no president's report this evening. So we go on to new business. The first item is the draft water supply collaboration agreement. Uh, Rick, you wanna go ahead and take the lead? Well, I'll ask district council um, to present this item to the board. Thank you, Chair May Hood, uh, district manager Rogers. Um, the proposed agreement that you see in front of you is uh, something that has been worked out in the context of trying to resolve the district's water rights uh, protest of the city of Santa Cruz's petitions to change its permits and licenses for the use of its water rights. Um, certainly the board and perhaps some of the public that, that regularly attend these meetings will recall uh, back in the spring, approximately, approximately in March, the district took a close look at the changes that the city was seeking to its water rights permits and licenses that was processing through the state board. And we filed a protest uh, focused on two specific issues. One being to protect, to ensure that the district's Loch Lomond uh, contractual uh, entitlement or allotment um, to, to, to water from the reservoir was protected against potential ambiguities that might suggest that the changes to the city's water rights somehow interfered or limited those, uh, the district's Loch Lomond allotment. So that was one. The second issue of concern had to do with the potential interaction between the city's proposed changes to the required uh, in-stream flows in the San Lorenzo River at the Big Trees gauge and how those might be seen or interpreted or misinterpreted as binding precedent for the district's Felton petitions, which have a, by, a flow, an in-stream flow requirement in the river that's measured at the exact same location. Um, and the city's changes, if they were applied, uh, whether inadvertently or purposefully to the district's water rights would essentially double what the district is required to keep in, uh, uh, ensure stays in the water system at, at, as measured at big trees. So we identified both of those issues in our water rights protest. And since then, there's been a series of correspondence and negotiations between the district uh, and the city in an effort to agree to language that would resolve uh, the district's water rights protest. And you can see the last exhibit to the agenda item um, is the agreement that uh, potentially would resolve those water rights protests that the, that the board just discussed in closed session. Um, the reason for this open session item is that in connection with language that ensures that the city's water rights changes don't modify or interfere with the district's contract rights, there's a sentence after that that indicates uh, that the parties are going to mutually collaborate to determine, are going to collaborate to determine mutually agreeable operational terms for the district to exercise its Loch Lomond uh, entitlement or allotment. So um, I think there was some hesitation on the part of the district to, as open-ended as that, that commitment is, 
there's some hesitation to uh, enter into or to agree to that type of language without at least starting the process with the city of talking about what mutually agreeable operational terms would look like. Um, we've only talked with the city essentially once, maybe twice about how, uh, about this precise issue. And the result of that discussion was the proposed water supply collaboration agreement that you see as exhibit as the attachment A to the agenda item. Um, and, and all of this proposed agreement essentially does is create a framework for the district and the city to work together, uh, holding regular meetings over the next few years and exchanging information in an effort to um, determine what the, what, what the operations would be for the district to make use of its lock limit entitlement. It doesn't commit the parties to any particular course of action, simply to meet and exchange information. Um, and the agreement itself indicates that the parties are gonna use reasonable best efforts to enter into some kind of an operational agreement by uh, 2025. And again, I just wanna underscore for the folks at the district that there's nothing in the uh, proposed water rights protest resolution agreement or in this proposed uh, water supply collaboration agreement that changes the district's contractual entitlement to the water from Loch Lomond or there, there's in particular, there's a 1981 judgment that interprets the meaning of those contract rights. So the district continues to hold that right, those rights and what this does is, is tee up a process for the district and city to figure out how that's actually going to be accomplished. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. We'll go ahead and um, start off. Uh, Jamie, did you have any questions or comments? Um, not at this time. Okay. Bob? Um, not, at, not at this time. Uh, Lois? Can we um, talk about um, flows at this time or should we wait? You can ask any question or talk about whatever you want. Okay. Well, I, uh, this is kind of a, I mean, there's always been flow requirements that I'm aware of. Um, and I, I think the, the bottom amount was like a, a 20 and the city wants to raise it to 40, which is double and really makes it hard to uh, for us to get water if that passes. And I, this, this is kind of a, um, what does this, what does this mean? It's a curiosity uh, question. CFS is cubic feet in a second. How do we measure cubic feet in a second. A second disappears in a flash. And does it include how wide the river is or how wide the stream is? Uh, what exactly does that mean? Because I can't imagine how you can come up with flow in one second if that goes by and a blink of the eye. Is there some magic doodad that does that for us? I, I mean, I, it, maybe that's yes, not- Yes, there is. And Rick, would you like to quickly answer Lois's well, question? Just real quick, there, there's modern equipment in the San Lorenzo River that you can go online at the USGS station at, at Big Trees that provides those measurements in real time and historical. Okay. All right, thank you. That answers my question because I just couldn't figure out how it could be done. It's, it's an interesting website. I'll send you that link. It has years and years and years of background and monitoring of uh, the San Lorenzo River. 
Okay, thank you. Mark? Yes, um, I understand from the draft agreement that uh, once the district signs this and the city signs this, that the city was gonna convey this to the uh, state board, uh, indicating that we're withdrawing our protests um, to their petition. Uh, when would the state go ahead with this if we do not uh, end up uh, coming to a mutual agreement on this? What's, what's the schedule or the timing of that effort? Currently, the deadline for the parties to resolve the protest themselves is December mm -hmm. 23rd. So absent an extension, as of December 23rd, the state board could initiate uh, administrative hearing proceedings related to the district's water right to protest. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Okay. Um, I, I have concerns about these agreements. Um, which are especially in um, item G, that it seems that some of the statements in here are sort of weak or passively written. So for example, um, that the city, it says, does do not preclude the city from delivering water to SLV um, under hydrologic conditions four and five. That doesn't, it, so that language means that um, these changes that, uh, you're talking about and you're agreeing to here does not preclude the city, but it also isn't saying that it requires the city to um, give, uh, deliver the water at any time. I mean, obviously not instantaneously or whatever, there'd have to be some operational limits on that, but it, it really doesn't, um, the way it's worded, give much um, confidence about that we certainly can draw on that um, contractual agreement on 314 acre feet during um, drought situations. And so I guess I would just like a comment from uh, Rosemary about that. Rosemary. Great. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, and Ryan Bazira, the city's water rights attorney is also on. So if there are further questions you can uh, add um, or correct me if I, whatever I say might not be exactly right. Um, I think that with respect to the actual petitions, I, the, the goal of the language that was written was to just document that it, that the, commitments and the prohibitions we're making on what we're gonna do with our water does not affect you. And, and I think that's why it's written the way it is. Um, I think that we could say something, um, something else, but the bottom line is we've acknowledged, I think in the recital document that you have a right to this water. And to, uh, from our point of view, there's not an argument about that. You didn't really answer my question. You said we have the right to the water, but you didn't say um, irrespective of drought conditions. Uh, go ahead, Ryan. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. Um, th the way I would think about it is the relationship between the city and the district is governed by your contract as interpreted by the court in 1981, which is 300 and 13 acre feet a year, doesn't matter what kind of year, wet year, dry year, drought year, it's 313 acre feet as defined by the contract. Um, the language um, you, you quoted, um, Chair Mahood, it is to go into a water right permit. And so the, the tricky thing is you want to acknowledge the contractual relationship between the city and the district without having the State Water Resources Control Board get in the middle of that relationship through a water right term. And so you're, you're correct that the language in the water right protest agreement doesn't expressly state what the contract right is. And 
basically that's because we don't want the state water board getting involved in our contracts. Um, and so th it, it's the contract that's the legal commitment by the city to the district about that 313 acre feet. And the language in the water rights protest agreement is, is somewhat more vague simply because we don't want the water board involved in our contract. That that's between the city and the district, not the water board. Not entirely satisfactory answer, but anyway, okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Any other members of the board want to uh, comment? Bob? Well, just, just following up on that, and you know, my apologies if I'm asking a stupid question here, but uh, um, does that mean that the state could um, put in place a water right that would effectively prohibit our ability to um, obtain that water under our contract? I don't believe so. Well, could they? I mean, I, I mean, I know we don't believe so, but is it possible that whatever comes out of the state uh, water board will in any way impact that. So, I mean, that go, it's a double-edged sword, right? I, I think the action that they're taking affects our water rights. And I think our goal in the language that we included was to establish a situation in which we acknowledge that we have a contractual right to, uh, you know, responsibility to provide this water to you. And that we have done a number of things in this, uh, in our, protest uh, response in the back and forth to, you know, clearly make it, it the case that what we're committing to with respect to the 40 CFS, for example, at the Big Trees Gauge and this situation and what our commitments are do not affect you either from the what you're required to release in the, the flows or um, our ability to deliver water to you. I don't think that the, the um, state board is going to get in the middle of that. That's my personal view. So just, just to be really clear and take an extreme example, let's say that you had available to you 314 uh, acre feet um, in a particular period and we wanted to take 313 of it, that we're okay doing that. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And I, if, if I could add just a little to that. So, you know, of course the the major benefit of to the district of the contract is being able to access the city's stored water. And so in a really, really dry condition like hydro, hydrologic condition four or five, you're not going to want to divert natural flows anyway because there's very little natural flow. You would want access to the stored water. And so you know, the, the language we attempted to draft was to recognize you would be able to exercise your contract right to that stored water. And I, I certainly would hope the state board would not seek to effectively invalidate your contract. We'd all have a big problem with that, I think. That's for us to do business with, not them. And just if I may follow up, Gina, or uh, Gail, sorry. Uh, Gina, and that is that your understanding of the uh, uh, the intent of the language as well. Yes, um, I, the, the, I, my understanding of the intent of the language to resolve the, the Loch Lomond portion of the, the protest is that it confirms that the district's contractual allotment to the Loch Lomond water can be exercised by the district at any time of year and at any rate, so long as... Yes. Gail, does that does that get to the, the heart of your concern? Or are we still have a gap? Um, I I guess I I never heard Rosemary or Ryan say that directly. Gina just said it, and so that that's what worries me about it. But I'm just I think I'll just let that. Uh, I think I heard I think I heard Rosemary agree though. Yes, and and I guess I would say that um, from the early days of the Santa Margarita groundwater basin process, there was a that there was a conversation at the end of one of the early meetings that occurred in Belton, and I'm on record saying you have a contractual right to this, and you can have it uh, under that right whenever you want it, drought or no drought, and 
that's on a video someplace as well as this is obviously now it's on this one too okay <laughs> yes right so, so this one I, will go in the archives yeah well you know i i really i really do want to um acknowledge that we plan for this it's not it's not something outside of what we plan for i think that it's one of the reasons why the operating agreement is really important to us, not because of uh, wanting to constrain how you're going to take it, but for us to be able to effectively manage the system that we have access to, we need to understand what you want to do and when you want to do it and how you want to do it. And that's what that's about. And it's not, it's not a matter of constraint. It's a matter of the opportunity to work together to figure out what works for you. And hopefully what works for you will work for us as well. As, as long as that's at the lowest possible cost, it'll work, I'm sure. There you go. That's <laughs> only one criteria. I'd like to turn to uh, members of the public. We'll come back if the board has any more questions, but um, would any of the members of the public like to ask any questions or make any comments about this agreement? Uh, Rick Moran? I'm unmuted. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay. I'm glad to see that some progress is being made with this uh, 300 acre feet allotment. It's been something that's uh, hung over us for a long time, and we should get to some resolution about this. And uh, I too had that concern about uh, whether we could get water from uh, this, the, our allotment during stage four or stage five drought conditions. And I'm uh, pleasantly reassured that we can. So um, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, I think if that is the, truly the case, then um, we should have a good arrangement with them and uh, look forward to us actually using that water uh, in the best way we can. Thank you. Jim Mosher. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, thank you, board. And uh, I have, uh, I guess I was a little surprised by the comments by the city's attorney and by Rosemary that we couldn't have this agreement in writing because the water board would be, uh, because it would get involved in the water board petition. I don't see why we can't have in writing what Rosemary and <laughs> and um, Gail and um, Gina just said, which is that it would be, it just seems to me it would be reassuring to have what's been said orally actually in writing. It, if it somehow shouldn't be part of this particular agreement, why can't we have a side agreement um, that confirms what's been said verbally? Uh, and uh, so that's one point. I just, I, I, I think you want it in writing partly because I feel like the city is, um, th these agreements are so based on, well, everyone's gonna cooperate and be in good faith. But on the other hand, the city uh, filed, apparently it looks like spent tens of thousands of dollars filing a, uh, filing a protest to our own water rights petition. Uh, as a ratepayer, anyway, I had, I was surprised to see this. I didn't know if the board had any warning or any, there was any discussion before that petition, that protest was filed. Um, and I just, I worry that, um, we, the, that we are in a one down position with the city and all this, and that the cooperation is uh, more one way. So I, I, those are my concerns about uh, moving forward on this. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Are there any other comments uh, from the public? Seeing none, hearing none, let's go back uh, and see if there are any uh, comments from the board, Mark. Yes, I would like to follow up on uh, Mr. Mosier's suggestion of getting something offline that we don't have to put in front of the state. Um, I believe Ryan was the one that made that 
uh, or implied. That's why we don't want to put it into this uh, agreement. But can't we develop something between the city and the district that's internal between the two of us that addresses uh, concerns that have been brought up by the district regarding this? Uh, Rosemary, Ryan, can you comment on that? I, I can comment if you like. Rosemary, would you like to go ahead? Go ahead, Ryan. I, well, we do have two agreements, fundamentally. Um, mm -hmm. We have the water rights protest agreement that would go to the state board. Mm -hmm. And we have the water supply collaboration agreement that is a side agreement between strictly the district and um, the city. To, to deal with this. I believe both agreements recitals recite that the district has a right as determined by Santa Cruz County Superior Court to the 313 acre feet per year. Um, if, I mean, that's, I think it's about that simple. Gina can correct me if she feels any differently, but we, the water supply collaboration agreement is intended to be a side agreement strictly between the city and the district that would not go to the state board. And so it is a little more open about how we will work together to ensure that you can access that supply. I, I would just uh, say that my reading of, of that as attachment A is that it is largely addressing kind of operational things about sharing data about flows and pipes and other things and, and really doesn't, says we'll collaborate on that aspect of it, but it doesn't address for example, the issue that um, that Mark just raised about um, timing of taking our allotment, or for example, um, any kinds of issues having to do with precedence regarding um, flows uh, in when we can take things out of Fall Creek. So, you know, and there's nothing in that agreement that says anything about what our priority is in terms of taking, uh, you know, water and. Um, you know, if our if our priority is in terms of taking water out of uh, of Lac Lomond is equal to anybody else's, it it I think it would be encouraging to all involved to have that stated explicitly. Um, could could I make can I, can I make a couple of comments here? I'd be happy to um, in the agreement that is the one about collaboration on the operational. Um, you know, developing the operational plan. I'd be happy to add a, a sentence or two that indicates the um, that the city acknowledges the contractual right entitles the, the district to take water under any circumstances and, and something like that. We could add a sentence to one of the recitals where we acknowledge that that's the case. So if that would be useful. I, I don't believe that we can say something related to the issue with the Fall Creek flows. And, and I will say this is why, because that our, our, we've, we've made a recommendation to the, um, to the uh, state board that would go into our water rights that would acknowledge that our commitment to the 40 CFS bypass flow does not affect you. And beyond that, I think, that your the, the, those flows and whatever they're going to turn out to be, if they stay at they what they are, they get lower. Uh, if they change in any way, is something that you've been working on with respect to some of the water rights issues you're dealing with, right? And we have, we've gone on record to indicate some of what our concerns are. And, and I do want to clarify that the 40 CFS bypass flow doesn't require the city to put 40 CFS in the in the system below there at the current flow right there right there now right now for example is only I think that's under 20. It means that we can't operate our facility at Felton unless the flows the bypass flows have 40 CFS. So it's an operational constraint. It has nothing to do with us having to like deliver water out of the Loch Lomond or not divert someplace else and we don't really divert in that part of the basin anyway. So I think that the issue with respect to the Felton flows is resolved adequately in the water rights uh, language protest resolution. And we acknowledge that it doesn't, doesn't necessarily, what we're doing doesn't apply to you. I don't know that it belongs in the uh, acknowledgement agreement that we're talking about 
the uh, language in the agreement to collaborate on the 313 um, from Loch Lomond. Well, I think uh, before the meeting started, uh, Rosemary, I heard you uh, exchange something, cut the tail end of the exchange with Lois about, you know, we're in the same neighborhood and we want to collaborate in things and really work together. And, and that's certainly the approach I think that, that I've wanted to take and I think our district has taken. I think that I would be most comfortable if that had been done within the context of um, not seeing um, a response to our uh, activities that is going to cost our ratepayers hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, take a lot more time to, you know, in the end of, at the end of the day, it's going to result basically in the, in the same outcome, which is um, we want to be able to move water from any source to any destination so that we can manage our district as efficiently as possible. And the city of Santa Cruz has um, uh, made that task a little bit more challenging. Um, I would certainly be more comfortable with statements about intent if we were in fact working together to be able to resolve those kinds of differences in a way that doesn't cost the ratepayers as much time, money as it's going to. Um, so, I mean, for the, for what it's worth, um, I'm I'm happy to hear you say what you say. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to additional actions that will bring that kind of neighborly approach to uh, our activities going forward as well. Um, I think our response to your activities was very measured, very focused, and could be easily addressed. Um, I'm not sure I see that on the other side. May I reply? Yes. Okay. I, I with, with the great respect, I understand your point and I respect your, your point of view, I do. I will tell you that um, the conversation that has occurred uh, between myself and Rick and others, uh, Gina, um, over what these many months while we've been working on the the before and the, our water rights uh, petitions were were not, noticed and um, you know through the process has a lot to do with recognizing that you're correct. There are we have we're both in that basin. We we have the ability to negatively or positively affect each other. I am entirely uh, re feel responsible and happy to take responsibility for avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating the impacts of my system's operation on the environment and certainly on you. I, I believe that we are responsible for that. And by the same token, I believe you're responsible for avoiding, minimizing, mitigating the uh, effects of your operation on the environment and the city. And our response to your petitions and your, you know, your uh, EIR, your, not your EIR, but your um, in mitigated negative deck was basically a notice on uh, our part to you that we had concerns that in fact, what your operation was might have negative effect effects on us, but that we couldn't tell because of the lack of information uh, and the depth of the information and analysis associated with what you developed. I, I do get the point that you make about your ratepayers and what they, you know, what the costs are. I respect the con those concerns, but I cannot let another entity externalize its impacts onto my ratepayers, just as you can't let us externalize our impacts onto your ratepayers. So I really feel I, you know, that's that's the point of view that I bring to this process, and I do think we we. Um, we do have a lot of work to do together, and I think there's a great opportunity for us to work effectively together, and I look forward to doing that. Bob? Well, I, I appreciate that, Rosemary, and we certainly would like to work on that in a neighborly way that would um, ensure that uh, the impacts to all involved are reduced. I do wanna make one very, very important point, though. Over the last 10 years, our water use has dropped dramatically. Uh, we're talking the order of somewhere around 40%. We are currently at about 38 gallons per water, 
per person per day indoor use. We are so far below the state uh, goal that it's not even funny. And so to basically indicate, and by the way, we're in a no growth environment, which is very different from other areas of the county. And the only growth we're gonna have is demographic shifts as empty nesters and retirees perhaps go elsewhere and families replace them. So we are in a very, very, very different environment. We have done unbelievably good work on making sure that our community's impact on the environment is minimized to an extent that I challenge the rest of the state to get to where we are. And in fact, at some level to get to where the county of Santa Cruz is. Um, so um, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly where people want us to go. 30 gallons a day, 20 gallons a day, in order to make sure that we're quote, not impacting the environment in some way or externalizing our impacts. Uh, we have done a really good job and I stand by that in any forum at any time and challenge other people to do as good as we are doing statewide. I, well, I think that's well said, Bob. The, the asymmetry of, of the situation is pretty striking. Um, are there any other comments by board members? Mark? Yes, I would uh, ask that Rick Rogers take uh, Rosemary's offer to amend that collaboration agreement to address the concerns that we've expressed with uh, being able to take water at any time during a year um, and put it in a more, uh, what, assertive, what was the word that you used earlier, Gail? rather than the passive voice, um, the active voice um, into that. So if, if you will allow me, Mark, what I'll do is just add that as a, a second component of the motion that we will have in front of the board. Is that all right? Please, yes. If, so I think what I will do then is, um, as we agreed from closed session, um, we. Our, the motion before us is to authorize the district manager to sign a water rights protest resolution agreement subject to certain changes. Chair, Chair Mayhood, if I, if I could, I'm sorry to stop you, but I, are you trying to create another motion similar to what we did from the report out of closed session? I, I, thought, that, um, do, I thought that we had to vote on this in public, no? Uh, there's no need to vote on the water uh, rights protest resolution agreement in the open session. All right. Okay. Then I will, uh, that, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the process. So then um, I think at this point, then the only motion that we would have in front of us is to direct um, the district manager to um, work to uh, modify the water supply collaboration agreement to include language about um, the timing of uh, our uh, using the Loch Lomond um, a lot, 314 uh, acre feet per year per um, Rosemary's statement that it is not with res restricted with regard to drought situation. Chair Mayhood, could I offer a clarification on this point? Um, assuming the board approves the motion that Chair Mayhood just proposed, I would take it as my direction to try to work work out the changes to the water, uh, the collaboration agreement and the protest resolution agreement both this week with a view towards finalizing both so that we have that done before um, the deadline uh, with the state board to resolve the protest. Uh, I, I think that that's fine. Anybody have any concerns about that? Okay, um, I, I had a motion. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second. Okay, um, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackerman. Yes. Director Fulce? Yes. Director Smalley? 
Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, we move on to the next order of new business, which is the draft annual financial report for fiscal year 2020-21. Yes, I would ask the, uh, the acting finance manager to present this item uh, to the board. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we are happy to be presenting the comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year 2020-2021. Uh, the draft financials were brought to the Budget and Finance Committee and discussed at the committee meeting. Uh, during the Budget and Finance Committee meeting, a few typographical errors were brought to our attention. Uh, one being on the first page of the financials, it was requested we change the verbiage uh, for the fiscal years to for the fiscal year. And on the second page, we updated uh, Mark Smalley and Jamie Ackman's term expiration date to reflect December uh, 2022. Both of these changes have been made. Um, and with that, we are going to slightly update the recommendation to be, it is recommended that the board of directors review this memo, receive the presentation from our audit firm, Fidok and Brown LLP, and accept the SLVWD financial statements for fiscal year 2020, 2021 with the typographical changes noted from the Budget and Finance Committee. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Andy Beck with Fidok and Brown for his presentation. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Uh, can everyone hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure, as far, as far as the PowerPoint presentation, did you guys want me to share my screen? Yes, I think that would be good if you can. Okay. Uh, give me one second. I mean, assuming he's a presenter. Do you see the uh, presentation right now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So again, uh, my name is Andy Beck with the firm of Beck and Brown. And I like to start with the independent auditor's report, which is located on page 10 of the financial report. On the bottom paragraph, we give an opinion. In the case of the district, we give an unmodified clean opinion by saying that the financial statements are fairly stated. Here we have a summary of the statements of net position. The statement shows that total assets were at approximately 78.9 million, which is an increase of approximately 18.6 million. Deferred outflows of resources were at 1.7 million, which is an increase of approximately 31,000. Now this balance uh, consists of amounts regarding your OPEB and your pension liabilities, and it's offset by your deferred inflows of resources, which was at approximately $67,000. Uh, total liabilities were approximately $43 million, which is an increase of approximately $14.5 million. Now on the bottom, we have your total net position, which is the net worth of the district at $37.6 million. And this is an increase of $4.2 million and consists of uh, your net investment and in capital asset. And these are your capital assets uh, used in operations to provide water and uh, wastewater to your customers and not available for future spending. Your restricted net position sits at $626,000 and your unrestricted net position is at $3.1 million. And this is the amount essentially available for future spending. Here we have a summary of the statements of revenue, expenses, and changes in net position. Total revenues were at $13.2 million, which is an increase of $509,000. Total expenses were $12 million, which is an increase of $1.5 million. And capital contributions were at $3 million, which is an increase of $2.99 million, uh, increasing your net position again by $4.2 million. We also provide a man management report, which consists of our communication with those charged with governance. And again, in the case of the district, that would be the board of directors and our communication of controlled deficiencies. In our communication with those charged with governance, we're required to communicate any significant estimates 
or sensitive note disclosure. In the case of the district, cash and investments, capital assets, pension, and OPEB were all significant estimates and sensitive note disclosures. Um, there were no difficulties encountered in performing the audit, no disagreements with management, and no management consultation with other independent accountants. In our communication of control deficiencies, we noted no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. All right, so to summarize, the district received an unmodified clean opinion, which is the highest opinion you could get. The position increased by approximately $4.2 million. Total revenues increased by $509,000. Total expenses increased by $1.5 million. And total capital contributions increased by $2.99 million. Uh, I would like to conclude by thanking uh, the general manager, Mr. Rick Rogers, and the finance department for their assistance in performing our test work. And I could take a moment right now to answer any questions regarding our financial report. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Um, let's start um, questions or comments with Lois, who's uh, the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee. Well, I believe um, during the finance Budget and Finance Committee meeting, we did address our questions and the information that we had received. So I, I'm, do you want me to say what the committee recommended to the board? Yes. Okay. The committee, um, we met yesterday uh, and we had all our questions uh, answered and lots of information and as was mentioned there were some small little problems that were asked to be um, fixed and the budget and finance committee decided that they wanted to recommend that the board approve the slv wd financial statement for fiscal year 2020 to June 30th, 2021. All right. Um, Mark, did you have any questions or comments? Um, I'd like to better understand uh, this 4.1 million of uh, net, uh, overall net position increase, um, which to me seems very significant, almost a 10% of our uh, budget. So I don't know if it's uh, Kendra to address that question. Uh, Rick, uh, can you help me out here? I what could this... kind of uh, answer that okay. question. During the year, you guys or the district receive about three, a little bit over $3 million in capital, or just let's call it operating capital grants because of the the CZU fire that uh, that the district experienced during, I believe it was uh, okay. late twenty. So, so it is it is grants then. So that a lot of it, yeah, three million of that would okay. be grants. Okay. All right. Um, that answers that question. The other question that I have is on. Um, the district's portion of the financial report um, on page 80, you presented photographs of all of the directors. I find that somewhat strange in a financial report. Um, to me, it seems like this isn't the, uh, the annual yearbook photos. I don't know if yeah, any of the other districts find that odd. So the district presents a uh, comprehensive annual report to the GFOA for award. And right. as far as these uh, reports, and I, I try to not, I don't want to call it a CAFR because uh, supposedly this, that uh, 
that has a meaning that's derogatory in another nation. So I'm gonna refer it to as an act for annual comprehensive uh, financial report. So for something that goes out for award, uh, my experience is that the board members pictures are on there. Now, is it mandatory? I okay. check it with the GFOA checklist and if All right. Uh, did you have any other questions, Mark? Or are you asking that our pictures be taken down? Is uh, I, I'm asking if any of the rest of the directors find that odd. Um, and if not, let it let it proceed. Jamie, I saw your hand up. I I was just going to respond that um, these cap documents are pretty standardized across special districts and um, we had to produce them in the transit world and although in in the private sector it may seem odd um, elected officials usually like to have their faces in any documents that their names are going to be on and so it's pretty typical in in this okay. world mark okay thank you jamie jamie did you have any comments or questions about the audit for the overall financial report. No, thank you, well done. Okay, uh, Director Fultz, Bob. Yes, and just to piggyback on, on that with Mark, um, I, I don't think we're being narcissistic here. <laughs> so I think, I think we're good. Um, yes, I, um, you know, the, the thing about these reports is that there's, there's no doubt in my mind uh, and after reviewing it that the accounting is all the way that it needs to be. Um, I've said that in the past, and um, I think our finance uh, department does a good job of making sure that the numbers balance the way that they're supposed to. Um, I had two, I had one comment on the content, uh, one question, which I think is uh, hopefully a very simple answer, and then I have a, a few observations. Uh, the first comment is on the organization chart. Um, my understanding was that we were going to include uh, the community at the top of the organization chart. Um, and I think, I don't think that was in there. I think we included it in the budget. By the way, am I still coming through? Cause I think my- yeah, Yes, you are, Bob. I think, I think my computer was doing some weird things there during Andy's presentation. Yeah. No, I, I, I remember you mentioning that and I can't remember how that was resolved. Kendra, did you or, or Rick, you wanna pop we in can, on that? We can make that change. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know it may seem symbolic, but you know, the, the community is in fact the owners of this district and they certainly are our bosses for sure because we report to them uh, at least every uh, four years, if not more frequently. Um, the question was about the document being searchable. Um, I, I was not able to search the uh, draft report and I'm wondering if that's because it's labeled a draft. It seems like it should be searchable, but, but it was not doing a search when I tried. Andy, do you wanna to respond to that? Uh, when you say searchable, do you mean searchable on the district's website? Searchable as inside of the PDF that I downloaded. Oh no, it should be searchable. Um, let me check on my site real quick, give me a second. Well, I, I just want to make sure that it will be searchable. It will Let's be, put it that yeah. Way. yeah, I mean, I I do nothing to protect this document, so. Okay. Yeah, Colin? it should be okay. searchable. Let okay, Colin sounds good. Okay. Um, Holly, let, let Holly respond. I think she wanted to say something about it. I was oh, just sure. going to yeah. say, um, sometimes when I um, put this document together, the uh, uh, different uh, components are not no longer searchable if I'm if I'm trying to use the bookmarks for the um, agenda itself. The um, the different components suddenly lose their compatibility with the searchable aspects. So it, so it may be just uh, the the problem with the act, the document that you received and that was posted. And when it goes on the website, it will work properly. Okay, great, thank you. Um, just a couple of observations before we, we go on to um, 
public comment and a vote. <clears throat> um, these annual reports are, um, and from my point of view, more statements of accounting. Um, they're not really statements of finance strategy or really provide a lot of insight into the district's true financial position. Specifically, um, the off books unfunded obligations that the district has, as well as a view of what kind of investment is necessary in the district's infrastructure going forward. Um, I, I think we've discussed before that uh, depreciation numbers and assets and that sort of thing are historical. They're not. They're not going forward. That said, those kinds of um, that kind of information is not part of standard annual reports, and I understand that. But I believe that it should be part of the supplemental information that we uh, provide to our community in order to continue providing a transparent view of where the district really is at with respect to its uh, true financial position. Um, and I'm hopeful that over the course of the next year or two, that we can get to the point where we are providing a summary of the uh, obligations that we have on our effectively credit card um, and the obligations that we have for spending on capital going forward, which are substantially different than um, what might be implied by some of these historical numbers. In addition, um, I wanted to mention, uh, or I wanted to ask actually, if that 1.5 or $1.7 million increase in operating expenses that we saw this year was in any way going to be offset by FEMA money, uh, because that is a substantial uh, increase. And I'm assuming a good portion of that was due to our activities around the CZU fire. We have, a, a, the finance manager has a breakdown on that, Bob, and when you get done with your question, she can report on that. That would be great. I think it'd be helpful for the community as well. Um, as you know, I'm deeply concerned about the pace at which our operating expenses are increasing, uh, which are consuming the, the vast majority of the rate increases that we have seen over the last few years. And by vast majority, I mean about two thirds of the uh, 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 net revenue that's resulted from the rate increases. Um, and I also want to caution folks about the net increase, or the, excuse me, the increase in assets that are on there. I believe that is due mostly to the loan that we took out. Um, and um, that loan, of course, is not, um, I mean, that's money that's going to a specific purpose. It's not sort of free cash that's sitting there that we get to do with what we need to. Um, so while they, those increases look really good, um, if you look at the increase in liabilities, that's a little bit of an offset between those two. Um, okay, great. Thanks. And um, uh, sort of a rundown on what those FEMA reimbursements on operating expenses yeah. would be. Kendra, can you want to respond? Yeah, so um, I kind of did a you know quick review of the increase in expenses that were related to the CZU fire. Um, and we have just a quick rundown. Uh, tree removal was one of the bigger expenses um, coming in at 422,000. And that was the portion that we were not able to capitalize. Um, so there, there was additional tree removal um, that had to be done uh, for construction that we were able to capitalize, but 422,000 hit our operating expenses. Our water quality sampling increased about 100,000. Um, meals for our staff was about 8,400. Uh, utility costs increased about 100,000. Um, we had some more uh, erosion controlled debris removal, which was about 100,000. Um, all of our staff overtime came out to about 81,000 and temp labor was about 75,000. And uh, just other miscellaneous items was about 30,000. So that's totaling about uh, 900,000. Um, the number's probably a more, but I just I just found this in doing a quick review of expenses that I could pin down. 
Um, it would most likely be a higher number if I went through with a fine tooth comb, um, but that would take, you know, a little bit more time, but that's uh, certainly something that I can get to you if you would like me to delve into that a little deeper. No, um, close, close, close enough is good. Thank okay. You. Is any of, <laughs> is any of this, um, yeah. is any of this recoverable by through mm -hmm. FEMA? Yes. Um, so a lot of this was submitted to FEMA for reimbursement. Again, I would have to f figure out which portions were actually submitted for FEMA, but that's something I could provide to you as well. Um, I, I think just from, from my perspective, a gross number of operating expenses that's submitted for FEMA reimbursement would be fine. It doesn't have to be detailed. I just want okay. the top line number. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I could get that for you tomorrow. Um, I don't have that in front of me right now. I think the only thing that wasn't re the only thing that wasn't reimbursable out of that list of FEMA was the hundred thousand dollars in increased operating costs for PG&E. FEMA will not cover those increased operating costs for power after the uh, after the disaster event. So, so that means we should be looking at getting somewhere around six hundred k back then at the seventy five percent reimbursement. Correct, plus the state share. And what would that be? Oh, I don't have that in front of me. We can get you that, Bob, with the number breakdown. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so basically then what you're saying, and I think this is the important point, is the increase in operating expenses really after all these offsets come in is gonna be somewhere more in the order of a million dollars, not the 1.5 to 1.7. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, are there any more questions, comments by the board before I go out to the public? Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments by uh, members of the public on the audit? I don't see any hands. Um, so uh, I'll come back and we have a motion um, in front of us uh, sent to us from the Budget and Finance Committee to accept the San Lorenzo Valley Water District financial statements for fiscal year 2020-21 with the typographical changes that were noted at the Budget and Finance Committee. Is there a second? Second. Well, second, okay. but I have a question. Yeah, well, let, let's just, okay, now we open it up again. Okay, Bob, go ahead. So would the motion need to include the addition of the, since we're talking about typos, would it need to include the addition of the org chart, the community to the org chart? Uh, yes, if you would like, we will add that typographical change like, noted at the budget I, finance committee and the change to the organizational chart. Okay, great, thank you. So that, that's a friendly, uh, friendly amendment to the motion. And uh, so we don't need to second that. Um, any comments from the public or any more comments from the uh, board? If not, Holly, let's go ahead and call a roll call vote. President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. <clears throat> Motion passes unanimously. With that, we go to our uh, next item of new business, which is grant approval funding for consolidations. Um, Rick. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, on October 7th, 2021, the board approved a request from Four Springs and Brackenbrae Mutual to explore consolidation uh, with the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. In addition, the board approved resolution number five authorizing uh, the State Department of Water Resource uh, Small Community Drought Relief Grant application. Um, and on November 4th, 2021, the State Water Resource Control Board approved grant funding in the amount of uh, $3.2 million. The grant provided funding for an interconnection between the San Lorenzo Valley Water District and Bracken Bray and for springs uh, to provide uh, necessary engineering, construction, um, SQL review, um, all, all everything necessary to install the inner tie. 
ties. Uh, currently, district staff and council are working with Bracken Bray, uh, Forest Springs, uh, and Big Basin on uh, putting together uh, and developing uh, agreements moving forward and term sheets to protect the district and to uh, protect the mutuals. Um, staff is uh, requesting to, uh, at this point, we do not have any authorization from the board to uh, do any construction or spend any hard funds for engineering, CEQA, et cetera. Uh, we would like to move ahead with the construction project that is covered uh, uh, entirely by the grant funding in the amount of 3.2 million. Start with engineering, put out RFPs, start the process moving forward. Um, the risk to the district is, is very minimal. It's believed at this time uh, although we don't have agreements um, in place with the two mutuals, we are moving in that direction. Um, we are also moving in the same direction with Big Basin Water. Uh, either way, the mutuals will become consolidated uh, with San Lorenzo Valley, whether it's on their own or if it's uh, through Big Basin Water. Um, I feel that this risk um, is very small. Uh, staff is requesting uh, that we start these processes Moving forward, um, I've asked uh, Director Smalley uh, as chair of the engineering committee and with his background and experience uh, in engineering uh, to participate in the consolidation process um, of the three mutuals um, working uh, with uh, my, myself and, in, and the engineers. Um, and I would like the board to authorize moving forward with the uh, with the inner ties um, uh, for these two mutuals. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the board for questions. Bob, would you like to start with questions or comments? You're muted. I got it. Rick, um, what was the original grant request amount? The original grant request, I do believe, was 4.6. Uh, million and now in, in conversation with the state water board they looked at uh, our itemized list of uh of projects uh and the cost estimate cost estimates for you know the engineering the rfp sequa they believe our the, the district's cost estimates were high uh and they reduced uh, the the grant into what they thought the actual cost estimates would be they didn't reduce the amount of piping or the project. They just uh, felt that our prices were too high in the estimates. And questioning, they have or are in the process of assigning a construction overseer from the state. And if the projects go over bid, uh, closer to what our original estimates were, that they uh, will uh, adjust grants before uh, the construction uh, moves ahead. Is that in writing? Uh, it is not in writing, uh, but what they approved is the grant application that includes the, the scope of work. I think uh, the scope of work is the most important uh, in this process. And we will not move ahead with hard construction if the, the grant finance uh, is not there. We will you know, re, uh, regroup with the state. Okay, so just to be really clear, here, the, um, we're short 1.4 million of what we think it's gonna cost. Um, they're okay with us starting to spend money on engineering and CEQA and all the preparation work. Um, but when we get to the point of actually going out to bid, if the money left over from all those activities doesn't cover the bid, then we don't start work. That's correct. Okay, Gina has, Gina has her hand up, so it looks like she wants to pipe in here. Um, thanks, Chairman Hood. I just wanted to add that we have had discussions now with Bracken Gray. We haven't with Forest Springs just yet about putting together a term sheet to outline what this process is gonna look like, I believe consistent with the direction the board provided in October. And one of the concepts we did talk to uh, the Bracken Bray folks about is the notion that uh, those homeowners may need to put up funds if the grant funding isn't sufficient. So we haven't documented 
that yet, but we did have that conversation. And I think it's fair to say, Rick, we didn't get any strong negative. No, we didn't yeah, really get any negative reaction. To that. With Brackenbrae. Brackenbrae is, I don't want to say they're super funded, but Brackenbrae with their FEMA money and this project, they're looking at almost being made whole. So they're, they're on board with no concerns. And, and Bob, I, I made a mistake. It wasn't 4.6, it was 4.2 million we requested um, on that. So we're only short a million. They're only short a million. And, and the state <laughs> did not, and what they did remove is the contingency. They will not uh, uh, do an estimate or do grant funding on contingency, only on actual costs. Okay, so, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say, at least certainly my opinion, hopefully I think the board agree, uh, you know, is, is a unanimous in this that we want this to proceed, but, you know, contracts are written not because things go well, but because things don't go well. Um, and, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that the rest of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District isn't on the hook for the million dollars. So the commitment that we have operationally is that if we get to the point where um, we've expended all this pre-construction money um, and what is left of that 3.2 million isn't gonna cover the cost of what we uh, put the grant in for, that we do not proceed with the project um, until such time as that money is covered. Correct. Um, and I, I do want to say, I'm just quick pulling it up um, on the uh, the part of the uh, the inner tie going through existing San Lorenzo Valley uh, upgrading existing undersized main is a cost of 1.7 million in the grant. So the district's getting a benefit out of this grant as well. Just a, yes, I, I understand a that. Yes, I totally understand that. But without bringing these folks in, we wouldn't be doing this construction at this point, right? At least not to this extent. That's correct. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Right. So, um, so just to be really clear, then we wouldn't proceed with any portion of the construction, even the part that benefits us, if we don't have enough money left to be able to do the whole thing. That's correct. Okay, and, and this and, and these improvements will also will be needed uh, as part of the big basin consolidation as this water will piggyback through the system. No, I understand that. Um, and so the, the second part of my question then is, let's say everything, you know, doesn't happen. The state decides they're not going to put any more money in. It takes a while to get everybody on board in, in Four Springs and Bracken Bray to, to basically cover the rest, which is not an inconsequential sum. Um, is the state gonna want any of this grant money back if the project doesn't complete in a period of time that they think it should? I think that's a possibility. Ooh, really? I can't say no. I mean- uh... Wow. Uh, there may be, you know, if we don't complete 100% of the grant work, yes, they may want the money back. Is there a time frame on that? Because that certainly raises the risk for me pretty. Uh, uh, okay. We submitted, we submitted a time frame in the application that we would, uh, we're looking at completion in two years. Um. Okay, again, everybody wants this to happen and contracts are not written for when things go well, but that just raised the risk for me. Okay, um, the last question I had was on, you mentioned something about Mark's role and you know, Mark's got a lot of background in engineering, but I'm wondering what, what specific role is he playing again? It, it's not clear to me and how that is different than, than just his role in the engineering and environmental committees. I, I, and, I and by the way, to, to, these kinds of these kinds of um, consolidations are probably going to touch a lot of different committees, right? Admin for communication, environmental certainly, engineering certainly, and absolutely finance. I, I'm not sure what Mark's. I don't. I don't understand Mark's role. Mark's role would, would be mostly in the design and moving forward on putting together these intertie projects. 
um, on I, that, that, that's staff work and working with consultants. I, I'm, I'm sorry, isn't that staff work? It's also nice to have support from uh, the engineering committee uh, the, and the engineering chair. Well, I think we yes, can get it support. Is. Consider it staff work, but as you know, I, as I will tell you that I could use all the help we can get right now. Mark's help would certainly be appreciated. Well, I think there's other expertise in the board that could also be, you know, done for other specific things as well. And I, I don't mean to belabor this, but but I, I think it's very important that we maintain uh, boundaries, right, between board and staff work, and um, if what you're saying is that you're going to expect him to do work that is classified as staff work, I, I'm not, I mean, I have a great respect for Mark's ability. And certainly if he wasn't on the board and you wanted to hire him and all the rest of it, I'd be more than happy with that. But I'm concerned about this from a precedent setting point of view relative to best practices, board policy and, and the rest of it. Uh, I mean, the board policy is pretty explicit about well, staff does staff, board does board. I do believe board members have been involved in the Felton consolidation. Board members have been involved in the Lumpico consolidation. This is nothing new to uh, have a board member review and be involved in some of this. Were, were they involved at a uh, engineering staff level or were they involved as an ad hoc committee to well, help negotiate the deal or communication? Involved in many strategy type sessions. Well, that, again, I mean, we can certainly put together an ad hoc committee if we wish on consolidations and I would be open to that kind of a concept, but I, I'm very concerned about the notion of board members doing staff work. I, I guess, Rick, um, I, I don't quite understand this. I, I thought that when we've discussed this before, that basically Mark would be sort of serving as a representative of the board if there were negotiations um, with uh, people involved with Brackenbrae or Forest Springs, in, in, you know, sort of the same way that somebody's a representative, I'm a representative on Santa Margarita. Right. And I, I didn't really think of him as being doing staff work. Well, it, um, it was just that we have to have one board member that kind of represents and, and is present for uh, discussions of, of things. So well, could you clarify this? See it, you know, where <laughs> involvement and high level involvement. Um, staff, a, a board member, um, the face of the district. It worked out well in the past. There never seemed to be a problem in Felton. It sure didn't seem to be a problem in La Pico. Um, I don't understand what the issue is now, but that's well, okay. It, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, a, Jamie it's a very had different a thing. Bob, Bob, Jamie had yeah. her hand up, so let her. Yeah, no, and I, I'd like to hear I, from Jamie okay. on this too, because she's got a lot of experience working with these these communities. So um, first of all, I, I think it, the, the concern that I take, Rick, is, is less in, in Mark or any board member's involvement and more in that it seems to me it should be the decision of the board who we select to represent us it, um, relative to any interactions, just as, you know, as Gail pointed out, we selected those representatives for Santa Margarita, right? as the board. So I guess what I'm concerned about is you're sort of identifying who you would prefer and that does potentially create some issues. I mean, because you have certain boundaries um, with the board in terms of your preferences for their involvement in certain activities, for example, mm -hmm. writing um, and communications on behalf mm -hmm. of the district. So for you to then determine that you want board member involvement in certain places that's additional does seem to represent some questions that I think we as a board need to have an opportunity to weigh in on. Lois? I mean, that's understandable. Yeah. Um, this is not quite um, board uh, involvement, but San Lorenzo Valley Water District uh, sent two of their employees to, in, in Rick's case, to uh, help with a grant. 
that we receive from the state a 100% grant for an inner tie between SLV and Lompico. And so the Santa, uh, SLV sent Rick over to take care of that. He did absolutely all the work. Now, granted, he wasn't a board member. The other thing I want to say about this is that if we dilly dally around, what's going to happen is what happened when there was a big delay, a two year delay starting on the Long Pico projects and everything, the cost went right through the roof. And, and also James was sent over by SLV to help out Long Pico. So there has been maybe not board members doing that, but there has been a record of employees working with another district to help them. We also had board members. I do believe Jim Raposa made the Lumpico uh, meetings and he also made the, the Felton meetings. He was on the facilities committee, which was pretty much the same as the engineering yeah. committee. Well, but, that's true. He was. So we have done that in the past, but this board, that was a different board. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to. Um, uh, uh, let, uh, Bob, go ahead. We'll just one more comment on this, and then I think we should, we need to. If, if um, I may suggest something, because I, I think Jamie makes a really good point. that This may be a topic for a board discussion about how we want to engage on these um, on, on these consolidations. I would like to separate that part from the question tonight and, and take that up again, perhaps in uh, January, if, if that's a, amenable to the board. Because at this point in time, I, I think there are serious issues with uh, this involvement being anything outside of regular committee work. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is I, I don't see this dilly dally as Lompico in any way, shape or form. Um, no work was being contemplated on Lompico until after the assessment was passed. The issue was that once the assessment was passed, the district did not promptly go into it. The, the agreements were already in place to consolidate. Everything was, you know, dotted I's cross teeth. I we think don't have that's that. what I just said. We, we don't have that here. We don't have the agreements in place to cover our ratepayers in the event that something were to go sideways. And I, 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 I really hope that that's not the case. Rick, can we quantify about how much the, it's gonna cost us to do this pre-work that if something went sideways, we might be on the hook for? Um, I'm looking at uh, the break. I mean, if it's a hundred thousand, I don't care. If it's a million, mm. uh, Mark, I'm gonna go ahead and call on Mark. Um, I've reviewed the grant application. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. I, re I reviewed the grant application, um, which was included in our board packet uh, to address Bob's question about this upfront work, which includes uh, getting the water service agreement in place, the CEQA, um, environmental permitting aspect, and then the design for the engineering design work. We're looking at uh, about 320,000 between those aspects, which is, I think, Bob, what you're referring to as the upfront work. Well, hopefully by then we would have, um, you know, agreements in place to cover us, right? Um, well, I, I have a few questions on what's being put in front of us this evening for this uh, grant agreement that I think might shed some light in this, if I can go ahead with those. Yes, please do. Okay. Um, the uh, letter that we received from the state refers to a funding agreement, uh, that a funding agreement is being drafted. Uh, but the letter that we received from them, I think is November 14th. Do we have that funding agreement yet, Rick? 
I don't believe so. Okay. Um, because I share a lot of the same concerns that Bob has already raised. Um, we're about a million dollars less than what you had estimated for. And I went back and I looked at the um, as bid per, per lineal foot for work on the uh, Quail Hollow pipeline, which just came in about two or three months ago. And if I take the third most competitive bid out of there, we're right at uh, the costs that the state is allocating just for the construction aspects. So I think we're gonna be short on, on funds if we go ahead as, as planned at that 3.2. So I understand from what Gina said that Bracken Bray uh, residents or the mutual was not averse to them picking up some costs, but have we put out potential numbers that we could be as much as a million dollars short? And are they prepared for uh, a cost on the order of several hundred thousand or forest springs or yeah for forest springs or for bracken bay or for both um right so my question is this draft the funding agreement that we're getting from the state how does it address cost overruns beyond the cost of what's in the um, of what they've allocated for us uh, to address bob's question on this these upfront costs how do we get the interim payments from them? Um, did they give us line allocations in the way that um, our engineering manager had laid out with uh, plans and engineering at 200,000? If they gave us line items for those, can we invoice them then once we get completed with those and, yes. get, and get reimbursement? We can take draws on the grant. Okay, so we can take draw interim draws on it. Um, and once we have the engineering, we should be able to get the cost estimate from contractors or outside consulting or construction management firm to see if it lines up with what the rest of the grant is giving us. Okay, then I think getting this funding agreement from the state is important also so that we understand how we cover or how the district would be compensated for any of these overages. Um, and if we don't have that funding agreement yet, when do we anticipate that? Should be coming anytime. Right. Because they've uh, assigned a, a grant manager and he was supposed to be contacting us, uh, they said within two weeks, and that was about a week ago. So I imagine it's going to uh, follow hand in hand, uh, Mark. And can I just uh, sort of follow on on that and ask, uh, what about a, a, a sort of an equivalent agreement with Bracken Brain Forest Springs about, you know, if we come up short, how much they're willing to pay or, or how we're going to deal with it. It just seems like we need to have also that kind of an agreement before we're gonna to feel totally comfortable going forward. We're, we're working on putting those together with both Forest Springs and Bracken Brain. But they're not. You had, you, you had your hand up. Um, my question was answered. Okay. And I, I have another question. Um, I, I, I couldn't figure out when I looked at the grants, it, it was clear that, the, that we were only gonna get the money um, reimbursed. In other words, there is no quote upfront money. Um, and mm -hmm. what I wasn't clear on is like how often that happens, whether it, it's paid out you know, annually or whether you can just bill them and they'll, um, as Mark was sort of saying, you invoice them and then they pay you some amount. So I guess what I'm saying here is that that sort of matters too, is whether we could be on the hook for 
you know, a million dollars worth of stuff that we're waiting for them to approve. It's kind of like the problem we've had with FEMA that hopefully we can avoid by negotiating something up, up front. Gina, do you have any insights into that? Well, uh, you know, unfortunately, these types of agreements are essentially contracts of adhesion. They're going to say what they say, and we'll have to take it or leave it. Um, but uh, once we get it, we can analyze it with a view towards better understanding these issues and how they in, may impact the district and what we need to do to build the protections that we can into our arrangements with the mutuals. Okay. Um, Bob. How, how far along are we with negotiating these agreements with Bracken Bray and Forest Springs? Are we almost done? Are we um, do we have any letters of intent? Do we, or are we just starting? We're just, we're, we're in the early stages. We've met with uh, the leadership of Bracken Bray, and I do believe was it either tomorrow or Thursday, we meet with the leadership of Forest Springs. Yeah, and we told them in those meetings that we would try to get, and I, I called it a term sheet, but said, you know, I'm not looking at a very legal type of term sheet, more of a roadmap or an outline. And we would try to have something worked out with them this month to bring back to the board next month. And then we'd have this, to develop a more detailed agreement from there. Because this would require a vote of the people, right? Certainly the final agreement would. For the term sheet, we would probably ask the board to approve it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be if it's not binding. I, I'm wondering if, um, given the discomfort some of us have expressed that this uh, should be tabled at this time and brought back at the first uh, meeting in January, that the, these two um, recommendations, because I, I fear that if, um, they came up now, we might have some negative votes and I don't think we want, um, we don't want that. Um, but so that would be my motion would be to table. Um, is there a second? I'll second that. Is there any discussion of that motion? Could Lois, I, say, that. Could I say something? Yeah, Lois is, I just called on you, Lois. Okay. So, uh, like I said, uh, Lompico got a full um, grant for an inner tie, but we had to pay the whole amount um, before the funding came to us. And I imagine those things haven't changed, but unlike FEMA, the state came up with the money a whole lot faster than FEMA did. And uh, I know we don't have a fairy godmother. Lompico, we had a fairy godmother who paid because we didn't have the money up front to do the, um, the job that would do the inner tie, the cost. And so I, I don't really know what to tell you, but that's the way grants work for the most part. I don't know if you can just divide it up into parts um, or not, but we couldn't. It was, we had to pay the whole amount once it was done. Um, Bob? Yeah, Lois, I think makes a good point. It, it might be good to see if we could get paid for each segment, right? Our segment, Four Springs and Brackenbury. Um, I, I did have a, another suggestion, Gail. Um, would it be worthwhile, <clears throat> excuse me, to also have on the agenda a discussion of what the board involvement, uh, if any, uh, beyond just you know, regular committee work, it is going to look like uh, for uh, these consolidations? Um, I, I, I certainly would like to yeah. see that given think, the discussion. Um, I think the way I would handle that, Bob, is um, 
we have a motion in front of us that we should vote on. And then your suggestion, which is I, I consider quite separate from the recommendations. Um, oh, that's fine. We had and that that we would just simply agendize, you know, at your request. And I think yeah. Jimmy sounds like she would support that, that I we yeah. would agendize that discussion sometime in, in January. Um, and at one or one or the other of the those two meetings. Um, but that, that's kind of a separate question from the, the motion, which is because we were basically directing the district manager to construct certain things and to do certain things. And I think right now people are a little uncomfortable for that, with that. So that was why I was, I had the motion at table. Gina, would you like to comment on I, that? I, sorry, can I just follow up with that? The, the only reason I raised it in the context of the motion was because Rick introduced it in the context of the approval. Yeah, I, but I, I'm, I understand, I, but it, I, I'm happy with the way that you're suggesting. I just wanna make sure it gets on the agenda before Rick takes official action on that. Okay. Gina, did you have a comment? I just wanted to add, and, I, and I'm risking putting words in Rick's mouth here, which is always dangerous. Um, but I, I think, as I understood it, part of the impetus to get this on the agenda was to get some board buy-in to just to get the ball moving with developing RFPs. Um, and getting bids to get this process rolling so that, you know, if the stars align as we certainly hope they will um, with agreements with the mutuals and the grant funding that we're, we're not behind the eight ball. Uh, Rick, is that a fair summary? I don't know that it would involve actually spending that much money now, would it? All of this is extremely time sensitive moving ahead. And there's gonna be this all the way through, through both of these and Big Basin. And you're not going to have 100% guarantees. There's going to be a lot of steps through here. And there's going to be, you know, a lot of different, you know, we're looking at hopefully grants of up to 20, 25 million moving ahead. And there's going to be a lot of uncertainty as we move ahead. And as there was in Felton, as there was in Lampico, but they worked out. Um, I, you know, if you don't want to take my recommendations and, and, and how I see this moving forward, I don't think I'm the right person for this job. No, uh, we Rick, need to I, this I, I think, I think you're looking at months of delays. Once you start going into committee and so forth, I, this isn't, these grants is very time sensitive. They want this money spent and I understand the risk and I understand the board's risk. And I feel the same way. I'm concerned about your risk, but if you don't want to take my recommendations and have trust in moving forward, I'm not the right guy for this job. I really would think we need to have that discussion moving forward. Oh. I would rather have that discussion before we get into, you know, what the board's going to do and, and how you're going to, because you're never going to get 100% guarantees on this stuff. And there's a lot of reasons why Lumpico is costing what it is. And it's not just because we held off on the projects. Um, and there's a lot of reasons what Felton costed what it did. But those were decisions that were made. So I, I, you know, we can hold off on this, but what you're doing is putting the projects out another two months. All I want to start doing is getting the RFPs out. Not much cost in that. Okay, how about can I numbers? But I do think we should have this other discussion. Rick, Rick, let me let me try to thread the needle here. Um, it seems to me that part of the problem is that there are two components of the recommendation. And the first part, which is seems pretty low risk, um, which is including authorization to incur legal and grant writing expenses within the amount of the district manager's purchasing authority, and, and also is essentially saying, go ahead and you know get get started on that. And I think mm -hmm. uh, what I it's the second part where we're yes you know, we're directing you to definitely construct something that I think everybody's sort of choked on. So would it, I guess what, perhaps what would be acceptable then is to take a vote on the, um, I, I could withdraw my motion to table and instead make a motion to basically uh, say what the first part of this recommendation is. Would, would that be, better and then the idea is that you know in january at the first meeting um there would be hopefully by then some kind of 
information from the state about the funding and from Bracken Bray and Forest Springs about how they'll deal with any shortfalls. Um, and at that point, we can deal with the second component of this recommendation. I don't know if we can have those answers by January from Forest Springs and Bracken Bray. You know, they have their processes as well to get through their boards and, and their votes. I don't know if I can have what you all want, probably not until February, March. I, 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 you know, we haven't got, you know, we've got votes from Bracken Bray, 100% of their, of their members to consolidate, but we haven't had any agreements going back and forth yet. And, you know, obviously when it comes to financial agreements and so forth and responsibility, that's when things slow down a little. So what's to stop you from uh, sending out RFPs or other things? That That's a kind of a no or, or low cost thing, right? To yeah, ask very, low cost. very low cost. And there may be, and you know, we'd like to run, uh, we would like to get uh, the water master plan updated to run those neighborhoods to make sure what we put together for design and so forth, um, you know, is the adequate pipe sizes and so forth. Mark? Um, I would like to see the district proceed with preparing the RFPs for both the CEQA uh, permitting and the uh, construction design efforts. And I expect that that's going to take on the order of a month to six weeks to get uh, RFPs put together for both of those and then be able to get um, responses from consultants. So yes, I want to, I want to see that happen. And I think that that's certainly within your purview to go ahead with that. I expect at the same time then that this funding agreement that we're getting from the state will be into us and whether we get it in January or February, that's okay. Um, because we're still working through these initial uh, steps at that point. And I agree with what Gail is saying. Can we, as a board, authorize you to proceed with that initial preparation work to keep the ball moving? So, yes, on that. On the second aspect of this, to construct the interconnection, no, that's what uh, a number of us are having difficulty with at this point the actual construction dollar aspects. So. Or not that we don't want it done, but just that to actually direct you to do it right now, given the information we have in front of us. Right, uh, Jamie. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say, Rick, I, I, I have enormous respect for the challenges that you are facing in terms of, you know, trying to get all of this work done under tight timeline pressures, knowing that there's a, a, you know, finite timeline on this grant money. And so we have this, you know, deadline looming to which we have to meet. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, I want to take a deep breath and just, you know, let you know that I, I really appreciate that. Um, that being said, I also want and hope that you'll take the deep breath and recognize it, that it absolutely is our job to ask these questions. You know, there's a lot of discussion that goes on in these meetings about the past poor decisions that past boards have made, sometimes because they were being forced to make decisions without enough information. So as challenging as that might be, I, I, I think that we have to have the room as board members to ask you those questions without, without you know, you thinking that we are questioning your abilities as the general manager. That's all. Bob? I think Jamie is just was spot on in what she said. Um, and I, I echo every bit of it. Um, the only thing I wanna add is that we also made a commitment to our community uh, that we were, um, not going to put them on the hook for these consolidations. Now, I think everybody recognizes there's timing, and a little bit of risk versus a lot of risk, but, but that is the commitment. And I, I, I call upon the Forest Springs and Bracken Bray people 
to accelerate their efforts as well to get us into a position where everybody understands what the guardrails are and what the rules of the road are as fast as possible, even over this holiday period that's coming up. Because I know our team is going to be working on the things that Mark talked about earlier. And I, I expect that Forest Springs and Brack and Bray will do exactly the same thing. Um, so thank you for your efforts and let's keep moving. I would um, like, based on what Mark said, to offer a new motion. Mark, would you let me sort of paraphrase what you suggested, if you would? And you can you can you can fix it in a friendly motion if you don't motion if you don't like it. Um, that we move to direct the district manager to proceed with water system consolidation with Forest Springs and Brackenbury Mutuals including authorization to incur legal and grant writing expenses within the amount of the district manager's purchasing authority and to develop RFPs for CEQA work and engineering studies. Does that capture? Yes. Okay. Can I have a second on that? Second, second. Thank you. Um, Rick Moran has been sitting out there with his hand up for a long time, so, um, oh. Did you take your hand down, Rick? I was going to call on you finally. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, he's, he's there he is. Okay, Rick, did you want to comment? And then we'll come back to the board for a comment on the motion. Go ahead, Rick. Rick Moran, are you out there? He's coming. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Do these mutuals have any assets that will benefit the SLV water district, such as watershed property, access to streams for possible diversions, access to aquifer and wells, any buildings, pumps? Do they have assets that we will take over if we merge with them? Thank you. Rick, you wanna answer that? The only asset that is out there that would be considered something the district could use, Rick, would be um, Jamison Creek, which is in the Big Basin watershed. And um, Big Basin water does have two wells, but both the other mutuals are receiving um, water from Big Basin. Uh, they really do not have a source or any aquifers or any facilities. All of their facilities have been burnt to the ground. Um, so they would wind up with all new facilities, 100% new mainline in um, Brack and Bray with storage and 100% of new mainline and storage in Forest Springs. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any dis further discussion of the motion by the board? Uh, Bob had his hands up and then Lois. Just to follow up on that a little bit, um, there's going to be a lot other, a lot more construction that has to go on in Forest Springs and Brackenbury area that is separate from and not part of this particular grant in order to get them up to the right place. So this is, this is a small portion of the overall job that's going to have to be done. Lois? I guess I'm a little torn over this because Forest Springs and Bracken Bay Bray need our assistance, our help. They've gone through a horrible fire. And I really, um, I, I don't know how I want to vote on this. I, I want to vote that we start moving ahead. But in the process, if we can't support the district manager, I don't want to lose him. I, I don't think that's what's happening, Lois. I think we all support him and his efforts and we're just- well, He wasn't our, feeling it. He wasn't feeling it. He, I, I understand that, but I think, um, and, and I'm sorry he feels that way, but I think we're also correctly uh, exercising our fiduciary duty as directors. So we have a motion on the table and a second. Um, Holly, would you take a, a 
Uh, roll call vote, please. President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Henry? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, motion uh, passes unanimously. Okay, so we now go on to our uh, last uh, order of new business, which is the board policy manual. Uh, uh, Rick or Gina, wanna take the lead on this? I'll ask the district council to uh, present this item to the board. Okay, thanks Chair Mayhood uh, and Rick. This, uh, I'm bringing the board policy manual back to you tonight for its annual review. Um, no doubt you will recall the fairly extensive process that we went through um, really less than a year ago, starting in um, approximately January of 2021. It lasted through about March or April. Um, where we consolidated input from the various board members and came up with a list of proposed changes and then did a red line and um, asked the board to approve the red line uh, revised board policy manual. I, I'm hoping that in light of the scope of changes that we did earlier this year, that this may be a more limited review um, that we can get through a little more quickly. Um, and, and to that end, I proposed um, a fairly uh, just here. Okay. short list of staff. Can we get or... Rick Moran muted or? Yeah, Rick Moran, please, uh, CTV people, please mute Rick Moran. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> um, so I proposed a fairly short list of staff recommendations for um, conceptually the changes that we would make to the policy manual and bring back in January. And I'll just step through them quickly. Um, updating essentially video conferencing procedures in light of where we are now with, with COVID and AB 361. Um, updating the section on minutes to reflect current practice. And this was one that, that Holly had a, had a great suggestion that we needed to do because the way the district records um, meetings and creates minutes is different than what's in the board policy manual now. It's fairly technical changes, I believe. Um, Combining the district's engineering and environmental committee um, to reduce, in, in part to reduce the number of committee meetings uh, going forward. Uh, reinstating the policy of holding regular board meetings twice every month, uh, first and third Thursday, given experience with having to call special meetings during the holiday months. Um, updating the board order business to reflect current practice. The main thing I'm aware of in this category is that um, we now have a president's report, which results in a short report um, from, the, from the chairperson typically, uh, which should be added to the order, the regular order of business. And then we need to do a little housekeeping on the section on the investment policy annual review because it's changed in light of the investment policy that the district um, adopted this past summer. And then I have actually one more, a number seven um, that we became aware of just in the last couple of days, which is because the board made com public uh, committee member appointments so early this year, it raised a question, when do they actually start serving on committees? Um, and so I think we're gonna have to be more clear that um, when the board makes its regular appointments that they start essentially January 1st and end December 31st, typically, unless there's a resignation and it gets filled midterm. Um, so here's, here's my suggestion for how we might proceed on this. So we have seven items in front of us that I think um, Gina would like us to discuss tonight um, so that we could have sort of an informal poll uh, about whether we want to accept them or not. Um, and those that we accept, she would then um, create official you know, changes to the board policy manual that would come back in a red line version um, at a board meeting in January. Um, and then if uh, that we would then vote on that there would be the official vote. Um, and that if there are individuals that have other changes and I don't know if there are or not, um, that they would uh, 
submit those to Gina, um, who would then um, sort of recast them in the same way we did the last round where we had a, a poll that would then be sent out to all members of the board. The results of that poll would be part of the board packet for a board meeting in January where any of these other items that might be suggested by board members would then be discussed and also voted on separately. So, and then presumably if any of those were adopted, then Gina would come up with the exact language that would be voted on in a red line at a subsequent meeting. So I don't, I don't know if there are board members that have other changes. Are, I guess the first question I'd ask is, are there other changes that board members, if you, if you have any, you wanna raise your hand if, if there are. Bob, you have some? Okay, so then, so um, if you, you know, um, I think that the process that I described would probably be, you know, depending on how many you have or how many you want to, we can get to tonight, but we, it might be. Well, I, I would submit them later, I think. There's, yeah, there's that, that's what, you know, we didn't, as I told Gina when I talked about this before the meeting, I was saying, you know, we didn't really know this was coming up. And so I, right. I think that we want to give the board, you know, members a chance to go back and and think about whether there are other changes that we've talked about and formulate them. So I think what I would say is that let's say that you get, you have to, if you have any changes you wanna make then you have to get them to Gina in 10 days and then she will recast them and send out a poll that you have to respond to within a few days. And then that could be at a, a meeting in, in January. Okay. And, um, so in the meantime, let's go ahead and um, talk about the seven items that are in front of us. And I guess what I, I was just thinking that, let, let's start with the one that strikes me as being perhaps the most substantive, which is the number three, which is to combine the district's engineering and environmental committees into a single committee. And um, Rick, would you like to, I think this is in part from, from you and maybe other members of the staff. Um, and I think Mark might have want to weigh in on this because he's uh, the chair of both of those committees. But let's start with you, Rick, and what the reasoning for this might be. Well, just a, a lot of the items that the engineering committee takes up, if not a lot, if not all of the items have environmental segments to them. Um, and it just seems a good fit that we can combine the two and discuss the two issues uh, with you know each individual project. You know, you, you take there's not a project that doesn't have significant environmental impacts, um, and they go hand in hand. And I think it's a, a good uh, would be a good combination. And what this year we've only got what one or two public members uh, on the uh, environmental committee. This year, just two, one. Okay, we one environment. Next year, one. Okay, yeah. next year, one. Yeah. yeah, and she's a continuing. Elena Lang is right. continuing. Um, I'll let Mark. Do you want to comment on this since you kind of have the most direct experience? Um, from my past working experience, uh, and from what I see, uh, in particular with the environmental committee, um, Rick, your comment about the engineering projects almost all have some construction or some environmental component. Yes, I agree with that. But of the issues that are in front of the environmental committee, I estimate that 70% of those issues are due to construction that the district is doing in various areas um, and needing to do uh, some type of environmental review aspects. So from that perspective, I think the, the link between those two committees uh, makes sense uh, so that both can understand uh, what the other side is doing. And I understand the, uh, the desire from a, what, an efficiency standpoint to be able to do those together. Most of my experience on the environmental side uh, is from doing construction projects and doing uh, EIRs, negative declarations, environmental impact statements. So that's where a lot of my experience comes from. Thanks. All right, 
Lois, you're also on the engineering committee. Did you want to have a say anything about this? Well, I've noticed for quite a long time that um, engineering and the environmental committee seem like they go together because the district doesn't want to do some infrastructure work that would damage the, uh, the aquifer or, or anything environmentally. So are we gonna vote on this tonight or? Yes. Are, okay. So if we're gonna vote on this tonight, could I ask Bob a question? Go ahead. Bob, yes. um, would you uh, like to be on this combined committee? May, may I respond? Yes, please. Okay. So um, first of all, let me say that this is the way that it used to be and it was not a very workable solution. Um, and the reason for that is because the outside of the construction aspects of the environment, the rest of the environmental issues that come before the committee in the past and should come before it going forward, the, the, the expertise is very, very different. And what was happening is that a lot of the environmental issues were simply not getting um, the kind of specific attention that they needed. So I'm not in favor of this at all. It was split up for a reason. And the reason was that the uh, topics um, uh, outside of construction are very, very different. In fact, I, I doubt that we would have our glyphosate policy, our integrated pest management policy, uh, and a number of other issues if we had this as a combined committee. It simply would not have gotten the oxygen that it needed to move those things forward. So um, I, I just, I don't, I don't agree with merging it at all. Now, having said that, um, I might be the only one on the board that doesn't want to go back to the way that it was because I think this was a good change to split them up, in which case um, I will answer the question that you posed, Lois, which is a good question, uh, after we get a sense of where the board is at. Uh, then I won't say what I was going to say. Okay. Um, if you're not going to answer me. Let, let me I, just. I, let I me didn't just, say I'm not going to. We right, have to determine let, let, if we're going to consolidate. That's fine. Let, let me just um, say something, respond a little bit to, to what Bob says. And, and I get your point. But I think that one of the things that has changed, and, and I'm not sure, I, I think that there might be a time when some of where I'm in favor of this, because in reality, I think we've been sort of overcome by events that given the fire and how much of our efforts now are um, devoted to uh, construction, um, there really isn't um, that much else that's done. Also, uh, as we've seen, the public interest in this committee has declined. Um, and I think that's in part because in 2019, a number of the sort of community-based environmental projects that members of the public felt comfortable um, talking about or were interested in were eliminated. And the result is, is that now a lot of it is, uh, you know, is fairly technical. Um, and so for example, Elaine Fresco told me that, you know, she used to be on it when we worried about uh, things like, you know, fu funding, uh, cleaning up the river or school uh, research projects that the, the public was really interested, but now she just, for example, didn't want to be on the committee because she didn't feel like she was qualified to really assess RFPs for consultants. So the way I view this is that it might be that there'll be a couple of years from now where we'll go back and we'll split them up. But the, the reality of the situation is, is that the workload is such um, both for Rick as staff and the nature of the workload for the committees are largely related to construction. So I think it makes sense to do this. But let, let me ask Jamie before I go back to Lois and Bob 
to have her if she wants to say anything. No, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm in favor actually of combining the two committees because I, I am compelled that it, it makes sense. And I, I understand Bob exactly what you're saying and why you're saying it, that it was important to separate the committees because it gave room for a conversation that was not just about engineering needs as it related to the environment, but about the, you know, our environmental responsibilities itself. So I really do appreciate that. But I think when I think, when I look at our mission um, as an agency, uh, you know, and, and what we're doing right now that is affecting the environment, um, this probably makes the most sense. So um, I, I want to- um, let, let me go back, Bob. Yeah, let sorry. Me go back. To Lois, okay, just out of fairness. <laughs> so I had a reason for my question, Bob, asking you if you'd like to be on this combined committee, because I would be willing to step away from being on the engineering committee. Don't get me wrong, I like being on the engineering committee. I've been on budget and finance that's what I've done for my whole working life. And the 11 years I've been on a water district, I've been on budget and finance. And it was a breath of fresh air to be on, Envir on the engineering committee. But I will step away, Bob, so you can be on that committee. Oh, that. Bob, go ahead. Your turn. Yeah. So I, I mean, so it, it's it's sort of basically everybody wants to do this. Um, I I do um, uh, I do say that I, I think we'll see if every we'll see if Alina wants to move over, um, or if there's even room depending. Well, on what well, we I mean that 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 is one advantage is we only have next year we had two applicants for engineering and one applicant for. Uh, environmental. So this allows uh, all the members of the yeah. public who showed interest to have the ability to serve on a combined. Yeah. And, and, and I'm hopeful that because I think Alina brings a very, very important voice um, to our deliberations at the environmental committee. Um, and, and it's a voice that needs to be heard. And it's a voice that I hope even though the focus here is going to shift over to engineering, it is something that she'll want to participate in. I don't know if Mark has spoken to her or not, but um, um, I haven't. So I, I'm, I'm assuming here. That, that said, Lois, I'll answer your question. You, you know, sure. I mean, I, I mean, I have an engineering background. I like to say I'm a recovering engineer uh, occasionally. Um, I've also done a lot of finance, uh, as you know. Um, but that path seems to be uh, not open, so we'll do this. Uh, just, just to be clear, we have not discussed this with any members of the public or anybody else because this is a board decision first, and then, right? So, well, I, I mean, you know, we just recently approved. <laughs> approved well, I, um, I, you know, I, and and I, I would hope that will, there have been and, some outreach. Right they'll be informed and encouraged to, I mean, I would encourage all of them to serve on a combined com committee and then it'll be up to them to decide if we vote to do this. Mark, go ahead. Um, I wanna concur with Bob's sentiment on Alina and her experience and background does bring um, import into the environmental issues that we discuss at the committee. So. Uh, if the board agrees this, yes, I do intend to reach out to her to uh, encourage her to participate. So I agree with that. And um, <clears throat> to Bob's earlier point, this, this is the way the committee for engineering environmental was handled previously, but then some number of years ago, they were split up. Um, <sighs> My thoughts on that are, if we find uh, after, I, I'm guessing we leave it this way for all of 2022, if we find that this is not working, and in particular, if we're getting input from uh, Carly that she doesn't get the, uh, the air or the uh, 
audience and the time that she needs. Let's rethink this then. Well, I, I don't think we'll get that input, but um, I think it's gonna be more of a board. Do we think we're covering the environmental issues appropriately given what's in front of us? I, I, mm -hmm. I, I think this, this is a board committee and a, and a board decision. Right. Okay. Um, so I, Gina, do you want formal votes on these? I think it's, it, or how do you want me to answer? Well, I, I had been looking for a poll, but it, it seems like the board, at least there's a ma majority consensus on this issue and it does affect how the district stands up the committees in January. So maybe it makes sense to actually have a motion and a vote on this particular element. Mark, would you like to make a motion? Um, yes, I will. Um, I'd like to make the motion that we have the district manager combine the upcoming engineering and environmental committees in January into one combined meeting. Okay, into a and second committee. I'll second the motion. Okay. Um, I'd like to go out to the public before we um, then come back for a final discussion of the board. Does anybody, um, and, or, or Carly for that matter, you're there. Um, if you'd like to have anything to say about this, we'd certainly like to hear it. But no obligation. Carly. All right, thank you, director. I mean, thank you, President. Um, and I, I guess, you know, in my mind, I, I believe that combining the two committees at this point does make sense. Um, you know, I think that's something we can revisit. Right now, a lot of our items and our budget for the department are focused on our actual construction projects. Um, so I do agree with, with Mark and Rick. Thank you. Okay, that, that's good. That's important to hear that from you. <laughs> um, uh, any uh, uh, members of the public have any comments? Uh, I don't see any. Well, Rick, has uh, Rick, Rick Moran rose, raised his hand. Go yes, ahead. and I'm unmuted. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for indulging me in so many times I've uh, talked this evening, but I do have direct experience with this. I was on those original environmental and engineering committees uh, when they were held as a joint committee. And I was uh, involved with them when they split up as well. And uh, to Bob's point, um, I think that environmental issues will be the focus of uh, people who are concerned about uh, environmental issues and they will speak up whether it's the environmental committee meeting or a joint engineer committee meeting. Uh, if they're committed to these environmental issues, they'll find the platform to speak. And that's what I did and uh, many other people did as well. Um, and the other part about it is, as my part as a committee member and as a board member, is if you can lessen the number of meetings that you have to go to, that's a good idea. So I, I would support this with the caveat that uh, Bob, um, if there are important environmental issues, they will be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for um, educating us with your experience. That's valuable. Um, okay, so we have a, a motion on the table. Um, any further comments by members of the board? If not, Holly, would you take the roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. No. Director Smalley. Yes. The motion passes. Um, okay. So we now have uh, the, the other items. Um, to me seem pretty simple and straightforward, but I guess uh, we could kind of consider it like a consent agenda. And if anybody wants to pull one of them now uh, because they wanna discuss them more, um, we can. And those that don't get discussed, we will wait and see what uh, 
we basically are, would be saying that we approve them, um, but we're waiting to see the language that Gina brings back in the red line. Okay, so if that's that's an acceptable way to do it, um, let's see if anybody wants to pull any of the other things off. And it looks like Bob does. So go ahead, Bob. Number four. Number four. Go ahead. Oh, um, go ahead and talk about it. Yes. Oh, you okay. want to talk about? It. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Does, Thank you. I can do that. Does Rick uh, or who who among the staff or Holly? Some who would like to address this the source of this one? Uh, this is this one is actually as much from me I think as it is from the staff, um, right. in that my experience both this year and last year was that we ended up having special meetings in July, November, and December uh, just because we had that much business that has to be done. Um, and especially because so many things have to be done at the end of the year. And it seemed like it was a better strategy to just have those calendared in. And if, you know, Marabali Diktu, we didn't need those meetings to cancel them, than it is to have to force Holly into trying to find times where everybody can be there um, for special meetings. So that was kind of the, the rationale why I thought this was a, a, a good idea. You know, as, a, as potentially a compromise, I, my, I, maybe we can do the December one, even though depending on the time frame, it does bump up against um, you know, certain travel uh, situations. Now, given that we're all remote, that hasn't been an issue, but um, you know, it was an issue in the past. Um, but the July and, and um, uh, November ones, I think are, are harder. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out is that, you know, it may be that we don't need them, in which case, if we do have a special meeting, it's certainly less costly to the district to do that. Um, from the point of view of compensation for the directors. Well, okay. Our, our compensation is so low. I think that if you calculated that versus uh, Holly's time, it would be that a lot. Does, <laughs> that that, that does, doesn't matter. I mean, we can basically say you, you should expect the potential of a special meeting on the third Thursday or the first Thursday in July, but, um, you know, don't, don't count on it. I mean, I could have done Thursday this week. Um, or even next week, but uh, I wouldn't have been able to make July or November. Well, I think all of us are gonna always have uh, some conflicts. And, and I, I could see that your point that sometimes the third Thursday may be problematic for certain years, and those would be ones where we would probably cancel. Well, or the, your... the first Thursday in July. Right? Holly, you had your hand up. Holly, you, you, you didn't have your hand up. Okay. <laughs> I thought you wanted to comment on this as the person that has to schedule these things. Any Anybody else have a comment on this particular one? Well, um, I, I, I wanted to say, you know, I, I, I recognize what you're trying to do and it makes sense, Gail. I, I like the idea of being able to tell staff hey, you know, we're not having a December meeting, you can plan your life according to that, you know, but then of course we have other work that comes up and we end up having to have these special meetings. So, you know, I'm, I'm torn because I, I understand what a gift it is to staff to be able to let them plan for not having certain meetings during the year in terms of how it impacts their workload and personal lives too. Um, but I, you know, appreciate that we also haven't exactly <laughs> minimize the number of meetings this year. Any Anybody else have a comp, uh, Lois or Mark? Okay, well, let's take an informal poll on this one again. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, sorry, one, I, I, this was something that was introduced um, in 2019 and we, we did successfully um, not have special meetings that year. Um, it could be that maybe with the CZU fire recovery, um, you know, we're not able to do that, but, but it has happened where we've been able to manage to uh, actually do what Jamie was talking about. So, but, yeah. 
Mark? Um, I would rather have the meeting on my calendar and be able to have it canceled a week before, two weeks before, rather than having to, a week before, make other accommodations for this special meeting when it comes up. So that's my thought on, on it. I, I totally agree with that. And, and it would be especially compelling if we get to the point where we have to actually have a certain number of us in a room. Um, being asked to do a special meeting on short notice can, yes. be, can be a burden then. It isn't so much now, but it would be then. Lois? Well, life happens. And sometimes we've got to have special meetings, but we also, I believe, need to have a regular schedule. So we, like for me, I look at, when I think the meetings are gonna be, or when I, at least what I thought they were gonna be. And I make sure I'm available. I always make sure I'm available because I know when the meetings are. Now, if one got canceled, it wouldn't be a problem. But, um, and we we have a number of special meetings. We had a special, uh, budget and finance meeting yesterday. And this is actually a special meeting. And Juan Pico is having a meeting tomorrow night. I've got three meetings this week, but it's okay. We have to go with the flow, things change. And we need to at least schedule what is forecast for the year for meetings and know that we're gonna be available. Uh, and if something comes up, then that might change everything. But like I said, life happens. Okay. So let's go ahead and just just to simplify this, let's. Uh, does would somebody like to make a motion regarding number four? Or um, go ahead, Mario. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Are you in a position to make the motion? Because yes, I, I think could. Would be, okay. I thank you. It. And then reinstate the policy of holding regular board meetings on the first and third Thursday of every month, including July, November, and December. I'll second that. Okay. Um, are there any comments from members of the public? Seeing none, Holly, would you take a roll call vote? Sorry about that. No uh, President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. No. Okay. Director Smalley. Oops, sorry. Yes. <laughs> the motion passes. Um, okay. Are there any other of the seven items that we would like to? discuss or pull off of the so-called consent agenda here? All right, so given that we don't, then Gina, you're instructed now to basically come up with the language for a red line that you will, a red line version of the revised board policy manual that you'll bring to us at the first board meeting in January. Yeah. Right, and just as a public service announcement, if you're gonna send me input, um, I think the board said within 10 days, which should be the 17th, um, just be aware that that input is gonna go into the, into the board packet as we did last year um, so that it's public deliberation. Right. So, and also, so just to clarify, Gina will then take whatever those inputs are and make them a poll like we did last year and we'll distribute it to the board members. We will respond with our votes and she will make that poll part of the board packet as well. Um, and then we'll discuss those at the uh, first meeting in January. Okay, everybody, I think I, think I got it straight that time. Okay. Um, 
with that, the final thing that we have is uh, old business, which is just the um, remote meeting authorization. And um, this just re means that we ratify the resolution proclaiming an ongoing state of local emergency and authorizing remote meetings for another 30 days during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's the motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, can we have a roll call vote? President um, Mayhood? Could we get just, um, I'm sorry. Sorry. Can we just check we have those a, public comments. Oh, a public, well, or Bob, did you want to just comment or go out to the public? Well, I was going to suggest we needed to go to the public. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Are there any comments from the public? Seeing none, are there any comments from the board? All right, now, Holly, would you take a roll call vote? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Henry. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Foles. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Motion passes. All right, with that, Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're uh, ready to adjourn. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night.